Well, hello. Now, do you remember me buying this at Thomas Watson's auctions recently, a couple of weeks ago here on YouTube? It's an ancient coffer, and this thing owes me, including commission, about £85. I mean, it's bonkers beyond belief. And whoever said that antiques were expensive? Because generally, they really are not. So this was a bargain bag. And don't forget, that's what I'm supposed to do, right? I'm going to sell it for quite a bit more because that's my job. I'm supposed to be able to find these things, prepare them, improve them, describe them, get them ready for sale, and then flog them for profit and then start the process again. That's really what I love. I've always thought of myself as a treasure hunter. From the age of five, I felt like a treasure hunter. And this really is a little bit of treasure for no money. And coincidentally, in actual fact, it's a coffer, as you know. It was designed to hold treasure, as well as anything else, including food, linen, ugh, arms. Sometimes you'll find these things a little longer and not so tall, and they're called sword chests, and so they were designed to hold weaponry. A real functional bit of furniture, this, the coffer. And nobody really knows how well this design is. It certainly predates medieval time. And in fact, the word coffer comes from the early French medieval word coff, meaning chest. And so it was obviously anglicised and then called a coffer. And it's a funny thing because we use the term coffer in everyday speech. You, you hear things like the government coffers are full or empty. You know, the home coffers are full or empty. This is a coffer. That's it. And you would also put people inside coffers. They were used as cots. And the bigger ones, I promise you, I kid you not, were often used as coffins under certain circumstances. And there were many coffers buried around this country of Great Britain, full of treasure in times of tricky situations, like the English Civil War, as an example. And I think I mentioned when I bought this, it's fascinating to think that the original owner of this coffer probably remembered the English Civil War. That's how old this thing is. And I'm always fascinated by what people did, what they dressed like, their lifestyle. How different was it to ours when this thing was new? And I'm going to give you a few examples now. So if you bought this new in about 1700, this is what you'd be wearing. And this might come as a bit of a surprise. This is what you would look like if you were a gentleman of high fashion and taste in the early 1700s. It might be a bit of an exaggeration, this, but you're going to get the idea. Nice big white powdered wig, lovely white face, lots of makeup. Men wore a lot of makeup, at least as much as women in those days. Nice velvet clothing, bright colours. And of course, not forgetting the tights. What a look. But what if you were a lady? Well, ladies at this time in the early 1700s loved wigs even more than men. So much so, a lady's wig could be as much as three feet tall. Now, bearing in mind the average lady at this time was about five feet tall, this would make them eight feet tall. Now, this would cause problems when travelling in coaches because if she just sat on the sofa bench, the wig would be crushed by the roof lining. So ladies would have to sit in the footwell or lie on the floor if they wanted to keep their wig in mint condition. Of course, the faces were all very white as well, all powdered up. But vitally important to a lady of fashion at this time were the beauty spots. And there was a language of beauty spots where a lady positioned a beauty spot was very important. So taking a look at this illustration here, you can see exactly what I mean. Every position of every single spot sent a different message. OK, so let's take this lady as an example. What is she saying to us? Well, apart from I've got bad teeth, that was a problem during this period. The spot is located just below her eye. So she is sending the message she is feeling passionate even with teeth like that. 
and back then to this particular coffer. So you'll always find that these things will have locks because remember they were designed to hold, you know, general stuff, but as well as heirlooms, things to go traveling with, basically treasure, money, right? So a lot of households had a lot of people and people coming and going. And so anything of value would have been stored in the coffer. So they doubled up as well as everything else as a safe. And remember, people slept in these things as well. And they were used as benches and as tables. Anything you can imagine the coffer was used for. So a multi-functioning piece of kit. And remember, this piece of furniture is the father of the standard chest of drawers that you all have at home. We all do. And I'll just go through how that happened again. So this predates the, the design of any chest of drawers in the world, right? The coffer came before the chest of drawers. They're lifted off the ground by these feet, these long legs, because the original floors that these things sat on would have been damp stone, even earthen floors. And of course the feet would get wet and they didn't want anything, any damp coming through to either foodstuffs or fabrics for obvious reasons. So the body of the coffer is lifted off the ground on these legs. And you'll find with many coffers, they're not quite as tall as this, they're much lower simply because the feet over very many generations and centuries, in fact, would get damp and rot and then the owners would have to shave the feet off. And so the coffers would drop in height and then you'll often find coffers with later feet added. But what happened in the 17th century, the later 17th century, as floor designs improved, people with a bit of money didn't necessarily have to lift their goods off the floor. And so someone came up with a great idea and that was to fill this void with a drawer. Yeah, so a nice drawer in there. And you'll see those things in antique shops and auctions and they're called mule chests, that's it. Then someone thought, well, rather than just using this lift up lid and having to delve right down below to find anything that we want to find, <laughs> um, it's a nightmare. So let's fix the lid and copy this drawer and make a flight of drawers, then it becomes a chest, a coffer chest of drawers. So that's where your chest of drawers comes from. But these things are so characterful, incredibly basically constructed with just big planks of English oak, doweled mortise and tenon, and crudely put together. And I mean that in the nicest possible way because these things are so well constructed and this really is evidence of that. It's been around for 350 years for goodness sake. It was pretty well made. And I'll point out a few features here, things that you need to look out for if ever you see pieces of furniture like this. Then I'm going to get to the price, how much I'm going to price it for. The top itself is a single oak plank. And there it is, isn't it gorgeous? Look at the colour. I'm going to vastly improve that in a minute with some wonder wax. Just watch what happens. But one plank, it's got a split in it. So what? It's an antique. You've just got to live with these things. And it's remarkable when you think about that that plank of timber was probably two or three hundred years old when this coffer was made. It positively drips gorgeousness. But now let's take a look on the inside of the coffer. This is where it all happens. This is what it's all about. Copious amounts of storage. The little box on the left hand side, by the way, is for candles. I'll get to that in a minute. Love the back. Old newspaper pasted. But I just want to show you the hinges. Take a look at that. That is a medieval type of hinge. It's original to this coffer. It's never been changed. Take a look at the other side. This is a wonderful thing to see. Take note. Look for originality. Now let me show you the box. So here we go. Lift up the lid and this was for your candles. Candles were vital. They were your electricity of the time. Had to be kept dry. Now look at the back. This paper was pasted there in 18. 52. It's a little snapshot in time. And I find this fascinating because here we have an ancient coffer with its own stories to tell over three centuries. But somebody in 1852, when this thing was 150 years old, pasted this newspaper cutting on the back 
of the lid. And you read what's going on in 1852, it really is mind-boggling. It just goes to remind us that nothing changes. There are things for sale, things to let, there are problems, and some people are having big problems like Elizabeth Pinkard, the Daventry murder, the execution of Elizabeth Pinkard. This really is a snapshot. I'll just read the first sentence. The awful sentence of the law upon Elizabeth Pinkard was carried into effect on Tuesday morning last. In other words, she was executed. These things tell stories and this coffer just keeps on giving. But let's see if this thing can actually give me a profit. That's why we're here. So I've checked it for woodworm. Um, it doesn't have any woodworm. When I do find a piece of furniture that is wormed, I'll make a video on it and show you how to treat it and care for it and improve it. Now, just a, a quick top tip. If, if you think you might have woodworm on a piece of furniture, look underneath the furniture. See if there are any evidence of dust. What looks like dust is probably evidence that you've got worms eating all of your wood. Now with this being oak, it's less susceptible to woodworm. If it was pine, it probably actually wouldn't be in existence. It would have been eaten by worm an awful long time ago. But this is clear of it. Um, and it's not unusual to find pieces like this with evidence of old worm. It's perfectly fine, so don't be scared of it as long as it's not active. You can just fill it with a little bit of wax, the holes, and it's fine. You can get away, as I've said before, with blue murder on these things because they're ancient. They're supposed to look ancient. It's all about the character. So what I'm doing is I'm using my wood wax. Now, don't try and buy this wood wax from me because I'm not selling it. I haven't got any left. I made it years ago about 500 and I sold them all and to be honest life just kind of takes over and I haven't got round to doing any more but I'm going to because it is absolutely honestly it's a wonder product and it smells delicious it makes pieces of furniture smell clean some people say it's it's like an aphrodisiac I don't know I can make no comments at all but when people have come to my house or be come into the shop when I've been waxing they, they just go crazy over the smell of this stuff but you can buy good beeswax with canoba wax in it um, B and Q places like that sell it but buy the most expensive honestly don't buy cheap I think you know in life generally you get what you pay for if you buy a really good wax polish it makes all the difference so it's a simple case of bunging the wax on and remember you don't have to cover every square inch of these things if you miss a bit it really doesn't matter don't knock yourselves out actually it's good therapy i must say i actually quite like doing it kind of when you're polishing something like this it's an oddity you don't really think of anything else and that's good for your mind hang on pull it around wax the back of anything if you can because when it comes to selling this I'll show the back to a client and the back often sells if it looks nice and clean and prepared and fresh then that has a knock-on effect to the rest of it now you'll see also here there are panels sections that have been replaced over the years that's running repairs it's perfectly fine don't let it put you off it's normal it's like having an old house you buy an old house the windows will have been patched replaced the door brickwork it's just perfectly normal so i think these planks on the base have been replaced at some point just want to show you something here these back panels are chamfered so they're hand cut and you can feel the ridges where the saw has been pulled through this timber 350 years ago and you're touching ridges that real people touched all of those years ago 
And I think that's probably why I have a love affair with furniture because they really do give you this connection to people long gone. This thing looks the same, it feels the same, it weighs the same. So people long gone have experienced exactly what we're experiencing right now with our eyes and it's a connection to those people. So let's leave that just for 10 minutes, give it a buff off and I shall show you it finally prepared, ready for sale and then let's put a price on it. How much do you think this copper is really worth? Back in a sec. And here's the big reveal. There she is looking bright and fresh, sparkly. The wax cleans it as well, so it's much smoother now, that timber, and it smells. I can't begin to tell you how gorgeous this coffer smells. It's now ready for sale. That's what it's all about. I've got to try and make some money here. So look online, you'll find things that look a bit like this. Wrap bags at 100 quid, too expensive at a thousand pounds. I'm going 245 pounds. That's it, I'm gonna to stick to it. It owes me 85 pounds. So there's a pretty good margin there, but you've seen the work you have to put in to get things like this. So now what I have to do is dress it up for the showroom to make it look the business and put a price on it. So here we go. dressed up and ready for sale. I'm David Harper, until next time, cheerio.